Running commentary. We are exploring listening to albums. It is a lost art form. We took an hour out of our day. We switched off the phones. We switched off the computers. We did not answer the door. We sat down and we listened to the artist's vision and concept. Cindy Lauper, She's So Unusual. Cindy Lauper sold 6 million copies in the US alone of this debut album, which was recorded in, Ju in the summer of 1983 at Record Plant in New York. It was released in October of 1983. Um, the sleeve to the album was shot in Coney Island by Annie Leibovitz and was in front of a wax museum that had been closed and... Um, she had bought her red dress that she wears on the sleeve from the vintage clothing store that she'd worked at called Screaming Mimi's. Her red heels are put out in front of her. She has um, these fishnet stockings on. She would bought the flowers that she has from a vendor on the boardwalk. There's this sort of like very 80s beach umbrella which is up and running. Um, and the hair is sort of pulled back in a sort of red flame kind of color and there's, there's lots of costume jewelry with the ears and the arms and everything is adorned here. And I think it, this album really album cover is really central to the reason why Cindy Lauper really appealed to people with this very vivid, colorful look that she had. The album won a Grammy for the packaging of the album in, in 1985 Grammys, together with the best new artist. Um, the album was produced by Rick Cherloff and William Whitman. Uh, Cindy was the lead writer on four tracks here, most notably Time After Time and Shebop. Let's have a look at where Cindy came from. She was born on the 22nd of June, 1953 as Cynthia Ann Stephanie Lauper. She's a true New Yorker, born in the Boulevard Hospital, Astoria, Queens, and she grew up in Ozone Park, which is my neighborhood. Um, her mother was Italian-American, Sicilian, and her dad was of German-Swiss origin. She went to Richmond Hill High School and was expelled. Her zodiac sign is the first day of cancer, as we've said. She left home at 17 to escape an abusive stepfather. She spent a couple of weeks in Canada with her dog Sparkle and wound up in Vermont, studying and working at odd jobs. In the early 1970s, Cindy was gigging in cover bands. In 1977, she damaged her vocal cords and was told she would never sing again. Vocal coach Katie Agresta helped turn that around for her. 1980 through 1982, Cindy Lauper formed Blue Angel with saxophonist John Turi, who she met through her then manager, Ted Rosenblatt. They recorded a demo with the Ormond Brothers Band's manager, which the Ormond Brothers Band's manager, Steve Masarski, heard and then bought them out of their manager's contract for $5,000. Blue Angel signed to Polydor and released a self-titled album, which went, as Cindy says, not platinum, not gold, but lead. Um, worse still, they fell out with Masarski. They fired him, him, and then he sued them, which forced Miss Lauper into bankruptcy. Cindy loses her voice again because of an inverted cyst on her vocal cords. Post Blue Angel, Cindy worked in retail and at IHOP as a waitress until a manager's spurned advances had her demoted to hostess and she quit. She gave up the pancakes, but not the pancake. Um, in 1981, David Wolf met her when she was singing in a New York bar, took over her management and got her signed to Portrait Records, which is an imprint of Epic Records. So, of course, that's not the whole story of Cindy's early life, but anyone could gather that we are dealing with an individual of character here. Big character. Big, unconventional voice. The album starts with Money Changes Everything, which was one of the singles um, from She's uh, So Unusual. Uh, this was a cover of The Brains track. Uh, they had been from Atlanta, Georgia, and renowned producer Steve Lillywhite had produced them. Steve Lillywhite was, of course, Kirsty McColl's husband. The song made top ten in Chile and Colombia. 
In the US and Canada, a excuse me, in the US and Canada, a top 30 song, there's lots to be said here. The first thing I will say, and I mean this as a big, fat, juicy compliment, Cindy was one of the few females who understood the punk vocal. So many others floundered their way through unflattering versions of the British punk style. And Cindy was one of the few females who understood the way that it works. It wasn't an imitation and it, it was an inhabitation. She understood how punk worked. Her voice is this sort of wailing sensation and it's this don't give a fuck attitude, which was what punk was all about. It wasn't the I'm trying to master, master the punk sound while I'm doing this. She has it. She's got it in spades. So it's a big compliment. So the reason I say this is this vocal on Money Changes Everything is very, very punky. Um, the trademark 80 synth line is on the button as a trademark of when the song was recorded. Tom Gray wrote this song, and he must surely have been delighted with Miss Lauper's commanding inhabitants of what would otherwise be an average song. Brava, a great way to start the album. Girls Just Wanna Have Fun is a monstrously large debut hit. Robert Hazard had originally recorded the song in 1979. It reached number two in the UK for Cindy, and the US... And number one in Australia, Canada, Ireland, New Zealand, and Norway. Top ten in Sweden, Switzerland, Austria, Germany, and Italy. Where were you when you first heard it? Um, it's one of those songs, isn't it? I was in the living room with my family and watched this chick play the Helter Skelter on top of the pop Pops with a pair of drumsticks. And um, was immediately struck by its effervescent energy. The video here was perfect. The multicultural backdrop of New York City sold this kind of pop ideology to an idealistically craving MTV audience. Oh mama, dear, we're not the fortunate ones. There was mischief in her quirkiness, but not malice. There was dressing up, but not conceit. There was feminine independence, but not arrogant detachment. It is a stratospheric pop giant of the 80s, and it has transcended the need for anyone's approval, including mine. When You Were Mine. I had to do a little research here. This is a Prince song. It was on his 1980 album, Dirty Mind. The genius in this cover to me is its parallel with Stevie Nicks' Stand Back. Um, which had been a monster hit in 1983 at about the time this album was being recorded. So you get the idea that they, they may have sat around and said, yeah, that would be a great sound for you to do, because Stevie Nicks and Cindy Lauper, I guess, could sit in the same pocket at times. She puts herself into the song with fearless abandon. Um, Cindy's scorching high note on the middle eight here is a highlight. I think it takes real conviction not to like Cindy. The performer here is so committed to the song. I'm going to buy this song like straight away afterwards. As soon as I heard the album, I bought it immediately. Um, and the relevance of Stevie Nicks' Stand Back also was that she had heard, it was one of the Prince songs that she'd heard, and she'd actually wrote Stand Back based on the chords of this Prince song. He had come in and played, I don't know if it was guitar or synths on the track, and she gave him a 50% cut of the song. So I feel like this was the beginning, like Stevie Nicks, Cyndi Lauper, later on the Bangles, Vanity, you get the thing, this writing for women thing. Cyndi was at the beginning of that whole evolution, so I just wanted to definitely mention that here. Time after time, how in the hell do you follow up Girls Just Want to Have Fun? You slow things down and present a vulnerable, impossibly human version of yourself. Time After Time is one of the most covered songs of all time. Rob Hyman from the Hooters, who co-wrote the song, also provided background vocals. It was a number one here in America, number three in the UK, number one in Canada, number two in Ireland, number three in Belgium and New Zealand, top ten in Australia, Austria, France, Germany, Italy, Italy Netherlands, Sweden and Switzerland. The second hand unwinds. The one-two punch of these two first singles is undeniable. There's no shame in singing this song 30 plus years later. 
Its theme of devotion is eternal and evergreen. And I think for this reason, my favorite Cindy song of all time. David Wolfe, by the way, who was her manager, was also her boyfriend at this time. And he's featured in the video together with her boyfriend. No, together with her mother and brother. Large parts of this video were shot in New Jersey. The song was nominated for a Song of the Year Grammy in 1985, which Tina Turner's What's Love Got to Do With It won. She bop. My goodness. When this was out originally in 1984, I immediately dismissed it. I'm like, what is she doing? How do you go from girls just want to have fun to time after time, and then she bop? Like in UK, it was like bombed immediately. Number 46. You follow up two top tens with a number 46. She bop. Like, what are you doing? Like, this doesn't make any sense. It didn't sit in with what she was doing at the time. Is this the review of this song? No, it's not. It's not at all the review of this song. That was me as a 12-year-old reviewing that song. Um, nowadays, you know, it's a different story. I love the frenetic Batman-like hook. Like, it's very, like, computer game, like, adventure, like, Batman. And I love the way she sings it. Her high-pitched signature hiccup vocal stuff. Oh, you know, that thing that she does with... She goes up there and does that, and they put reverb on it, and it's a very effective uh, stylistic scene she does. Um, Bebop Alula is a Gene Vincent classic, and Cindy's pop culture references tended to be on the more sort of alternative side. She sort of went for the things that were sort of like off to the side, revered, but right, revered by a smaller group of people, while Madonna would go for the obvious and the big film stars of the past. Cindy would sort of go for those minor, you know, lower kind of down on the priority list. She'd sort of go for the B list of what was big in the 50s and 60s. Um, it's my second favorite Cyndi Lauper song of all time. Um, and before we get into the detail, um, the vid in the video we see um, Master Bingo, or Master Bingo, we see self-service, Nirvana. We see the, the dark glasses of going blind. Are, are you picking up what I'm rubbing out? Sorry, putting down here. Um, you know, I, I wonder if we could ever have deduced that this is the kind of fun that girls wanted to have. Um, what we're talking about here, of course, is getting one's jollies and female masturbation, which is the very... <laughs> Um, you know, I um, mean, controversial subject title. I don't know who she's starring with in the video in that white pantsuit with the the glasses on and swinging the uh, swinging the walking sticks um, and the heads going like this. Um, the frenetic Batman line turns Tom and Jerry, and it's be bop blue she bop. You know, it's like no 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 no. It's really really good. It's so creative. London, Paris, New York, Munich. Everybody talk about bop music. This is a really very very good pop song. Well done, Cindy. Here's one in your eye. Um, incidentally, she bop was a number three hit in the U.S. and Canada. Scored top ten in Australia, Austria, New Zealand. South Africa and Switzerland. All through the night uh, starts with this super twinkly intro. Um, Jules Shear wrote this song and sung background vocals on Cindy's hit version. I like the song. I think her habit of using male background vocals on her songs was a trademark and particularly on slower material was a shrewd production decision. I think Cindy has a folk sensibility, uh, which gives her music an appeal to a wider range of age groups. Uh, that hippie-ish Peter, Paul and Mary vibe of guys and girls singing along together. Uh, now this didn't do as well in the world charts, but it did mean that Cyndi Lauper was the first ever artist to score four top five hits from a debut album as a female artist. And I think we have to give her props for that. Austria and Canada also made this a top 10. Witness is the next track on the album. It bounces in with a Scar style intro. She's given us so many great ones on this album, this isn't one of them. But I'm not mad at her. 
the vocal is present. Her performance isn't flagging. I'm just not into the song. Um, I'll kiss you. There's cross-references here to Love Potion Number 9 and Get Ready, Here I Come. It's irresistibly 80s and idiosyncratic. It fits beautifully on this album. It's both punky and funky. Can you tell that I don't really listen to much of her stuff? I can't deny it. I like her. She kicks so much female rock ass. This is my kind of woman. I'll Kiss You was co-written with Jewel Shear, who had co-written All Through the Night. He's So Unusual is a 45 second scratchy 78 record vibe with Cindy singing Four Queens Braug, a twist on the album title. It's distinctive. Any longer it would be annoying. Do you hear me? It would be. It isn't. The production on this album is super smart. Yeah, yeah, sees us out. Male background vocals again. The classic 80s Blues Brothers synth is present, a new wave staple. Um, there's such generosity of spirit here, isn't there? If Cindy likes you, she puts you on the album. If you had a song she likes, she records it and has you do, has you, has you do backing vocals on it. The song's fine. We're in her world now and she's made us incredibly welcome. On the rumour mill, it has been said that Cindy Lauper was absent during late 1985 and early 1986 due to a cancer scare of some description. I don't want it to be true, but knowing our luck, it is true, because I don't know what you think, but this lady strikes me as a good person, and as we all know, shit things happen to good people. Cindy Lauper is honest, fearless, and she goes to bat for the underdog. I never think of her as bitchy or malevolent. I think of her as a champion for people who are beaten down by their circumstances. The spirit of what she does and how she does it supersedes the, ne the need for the material to be approved. I love the She's So Unusual album because it is self selfless and positively transportive. I just want to do a little side note about Madonna, as Cindy Lauper calls her, and uh, she talks about, you know, um, Madonna apparently refers to her as the evil cousin. Um, and they both had that sort of Italian descent thing. And they were, as Cindy says, coming up at the same time. And there's a great little story where she says, she says, when they were in the height of their success, she goes, well, what's Madonna doing? If Madonna's not doing it, we're not doing it. So I just love this relationship between them. You know, you also see her uh, hanging out with Lady Gaga recently and, you know, just being a general all-round good egg as well as all of this kinky boots promotion stuff that she's doing. So the final mark for um, Cindy Lauper, She's So Unusual, is 94%. Cindy Lauper, it's love. Oh,